So we were at a rodeo. Yeah, we were. Recently. Um, which, if you haven't been to one, you got to go. What are you even doing with your life? What are you even doing? Yeah. And while we were there, this guy was walking around, um, and his, on his shirt said something, and it caught my eye, and it said, it's not a dad bod, it's a father figure. Beautiful. And yeah. I looked at Levi, and I was like, There's Father's our Father's Day, Day, message. Day message right there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, God. Message box checked. Right. <laughs> but basically... We want to talk today about the father what figure. What is a father figure? What is like? a father figure? And what is the father figure? I think they figure? call it, it's, they're describing what happens when you get a little fluffy. That's the nice way to describe <laughs> the dad bod. The weight you put on, like the COVID 19 pounds, right? Like the, the father figure, 25 pounds, you know, becoming a dad because you're finishing all your kids' chicken fingers because you can't let them go to waste. So oh instead, my they gosh, go that's on such your waist. A real thing. It's such a real thing. A no, real like, thing. I'll eat a salad. Like, I'm eating healthy. And then I'll eat. Well, you're their walking mac out the door. Cheese. It's like, what's all that mac and cheese doing? Can't let that, yeah. <laughs> I know. They're starving people in the world, Jennifer. I know. So now, so you know, you, when you've got food. the dad bod, you know you got the dad bod when you used to look like Zach Efron, but now you look like Zach Galifianakis. Like, that's the, <laughs> that's the transition, right? That's the. So basically, that term dad bod started off as a term of endearment. And it actually celebrates the all body types of the men. The swag and wagon. <laughs> it's the whole thing. But that you don't have to have a lean, shredded body to be awesome. And actually, there was a study um, where it showed that 75% of women. Yeah. You, t you tell me. <laughs> that was a question or a statement. I wasn't sure. Who knows? The mouth said statement. The eyes said question. <laughs> <laughs> Who actually prefers... A dad bod hey, to six pack, like you might have had it all wrong trying to get that eight pack. You know, it's like 75% of women I know. prefer the dad bod. Yeah, so why? Oh, well, the article, this study was, by the way, done by Planet Fitness. Uh, so <laughs> everything's tongue in cheek with Planet Fitness. But, uh, but they, uh, they said that it's for two reasons. Number one is that, uh, and this makes sense, you know, they, they assume that someone who's just like, you can see the veins on all their bulging muscles, it's like, uh, maybe is a little self-obsessed, right? And it, being in a relationship with that person might involve a lot of preening in front of the mirror. Uh, but then the other reason is I think personally uh, makes women feel less pressure on, the, on themselves to be with someone who looks like that. So, All that to say, regardless... We're just reporting the news here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> regardless of what women prefer, there are people who need a father figure in their life and wow. who... It's very important for the children in our life, for the people in our life, to see the kind of life that we're living, the fog, father figure that you, model that you that are father meant to figure. be. Yeah, good. Um, one, we know this, but one out of every three children in America lives in a home without their biological dad. Um, and a father figure, whether he's the, bio, the child's biological dad, stepdad, foster dad, grandpa, another close male adult, can help with so much confidence issues and, and behavioral problems that we see so often if we have the, those men in our lives to, to lead us and to show us the way um, to be that role model and to be someone who's coming alongside and encouraging. In a girl's life, we can see that a father figure who truly believes in her and loves her gives her the confidence to overcome challenges, as she feels accepted and loved, she can go forward with confidence in her relationships, her romantic relationships. And so I just, today, this weekend, we just wanna encourage you as dads, and really the men of the house, to be the father figure that God's called you to be. Yeah, and it's not a message of shame. This no. isn't a message of, you know, you, you, you don't have that in your life right now. You maybe, whatever circumstances are, aren't connected with your kids. This isn't a message about condemnation for your past. It's about vision for your future. Yes. And we just wanted to speak over you that you make a difference in the life of your kids. You make a difference simply by virtue of showing 
up for duty. Yes. And study after study after study after study shows what an impact it can make even when the biological father is not in the scene, if there is a man present in the life of a home, what it does, what it, what it does to grades, what it does to, to rates of, of going to prison, what it does to substance abuse, what it does to suicidal attempts, what it does uh, just to a life when they have someone actively as a man in their life that cares for them. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, we, we both feel so strongly in our hearts that as we fight for church, and Fresh Life Church to be the, the, the realization of what God intends, it's a place where he, as the father to the fatherless, can. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, what, what, a, what a wonderful thing that the children of our communities uh, can have men of God raised up within the church who are present, that as, as, as kids are checked in uh, to, to class every single week across our church, a part of uh, these Fresh Life groups and just in doing life as a family, what kids get to, to see and, and, and by way of examples of men. I'm so grateful. We are so grateful mm -hmm. to partner with Fresh Life Church as we raise our kids, that we know our kids, they're not just hearing truth from just us. Because kids do get tone deaf to the sound of your voice after a while. Uh, so to hear, and it's, it's the best thing ever when your kids tell you something that someone told them that you've told them their whole lives. And they're like, but yeah. it just really made sense, mom and dad. And you're like, you have to really bite your tongue right then and there. <laughs> and just, just say, thank God that we get to partner with the yes. church community, yes. that there are men and women of God that get to be a part of the garden where our little saplings are growing up and the nutrients get shared yes. around. Yes. It's incredible. It's so good. It's so good. And so no matter your body type, we're looking at what it looks like to have Why did you side-eye me when you said that? Figure. I didn't. I just felt it. I felt I'm just, <laughs> You looked over this plant at me, and I felt judgment. Oh, something's come between us. Um, but I love how in 1 Timothy it says, um, Paul's This plant talking is to between Timothy. two Luscos. <laughs> hey, it's the Luscos. Um, Oh, our podcast. I didn't know you were going to plug our podcast. I was making a Zach Galifianakis joke. It's really great what yeah. you've done. What were you saying? Continue. I'm distracted by your beauty. Paul, Paul was telling Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. So good. And so that's what's so beautiful about celebra celebrating all the men in the house, because no matter what stage of life you're in, you get to be that example, and you get to um, be part of the family that God's called us to be in this fresh life house, to, to love the older people as mothers as fathers, younger people as sisters in purity. And I just believe that over all of you today um, as we celebrate fathers, but also as we continue in this series that we've been in, a secret to a good, the secret yeah, so to true. a good life. And what you're saying, just, I just, as you were saying it, I just thought about how Pastor Louis Giglio is one of the men on this earth that God has raised up to be a spiritual father to me. Mm. And he and Shelly have no natural children, but I, I think of him as a father every time mm. I'm around him. I feel like I'm, I'm spending time totally. with a spiritual dad. I know you feel the same way as well. Yeah. So I just, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just feel like this, this Father's Day, God's quickening some of us to see we have the impact of a father inside yeah. this church and on this earth in ways that we might not know. So let's just stretch our imaginations as we continue. What, what is the secret to a good life? I think it's remembering it doesn't need to be upgraded. That's what we've been hammering home every week. We live in a world full of upgrades. Everything's got to be better. New, improved, improving. 2x, 100x. Every, walk down the grocery store aisle and see how much stuff is like triple formula, brand new. They, there's not that much technology going on in the toothpaste industry, OK? <laughs> but everything is being sold to you as triple strength. It'll melt your teeth when it makes contact with them. <laughs> now with more peroxide. You know, it's like, ah, right? Hmm. But we're, we're seeing that in scripture, the story of of following Jesus is God made something and mm, called it good. Yes. And so there's some things in this world that do not need to be tampered with. He had it right the first time. Yeah. And like what God has called good, let no man draw asunder kind of a thing. And mm. so we're learning to take a few steps back. We don't want new Coke. We, you can't beat the real thing. And we're, <laughs> we're sticking with that. And that's what the heartbeat of the series is all about. Yes, we've been in Micah and focusing on Chapter 6, verse 8. Let's read that text again together. Which says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly 
with your God. And today we're going to look at the last five words of this verse. Walk humbly with your God. And we're going to discuss what it looks like to get this father figure, to spiritually have this um, dad bod, this heart to, to love and, um, and give when it comes to being a father. And so number one, we're looking at walk. Walk humbly with your God. We'll have a real easy way of knowing when the sermon's almost done, because we have five points and for five words. So we're going to say something about all five of them, starting with easy. walk. Walk. Which, in the Cambridge Dictionary, which Ooh. is different than the regular dictionary, it She means, likes it fancy. <laughs> Cambridge Dictionary. It means to move along by putting one foot in front of the other, allowing each foot to touch the ground before lifting the next. One foot in front of the other. Simple. Easy. This life that we're meant to live, the secret to this good life that we're meant to live, is a walk. It's meant to be a walk. We were born to walk with God. Adam, in Genesis we know that Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. There was this effortless walk that he had with his creator. There was a natural humility that came with him walking with his father, his friend. And we were learning a few weeks ago that you can't have a good life without a good shepherd. And we're learning that we're meant to walk with God who is our good shepherd. Um, many years back, Levi broke his femur. Thanks, was, for, bring, thanks for bringing that up. It was up. a very, very hard time in your yeah. life and my life. But he had surgery. Well, he had to wait a little bit to get the surgery. I was in traction for a whole overnight because I was on a snowmobile accident and then right before they were about to take me into surgery to put this titanium rod in, someone on the Whitefish Mountain Resort um, was sitting below a jump. You shouldn't sit below a jump, in case you don't know. Uh, and some, a skier went off the jump, and the two skis went right into his, between his shoulder blades. Thunk, and so, so they bumped bad. me from the surgical rotation so they could deal with that because he was more pressing. And then once that got done, the next day, after a night in traction, in agony, uh, they finally got in and got my, my leg done. So, the, but the day of surgery, they had you walking. With crutches, but yeah, With putting crutches. some pressure on it. Yeah, yeah but they, they go, the idea of... We want you to put about 20 pounds of pressure on it. I was like, uh... <laughs> uh that's about it. That's um, one seventeenth of me. <laughs> and then... I was it, fluffier back then. It, your dad had hip replacement surgery. Double. Double hip replacement surgery. And within the hour, they had him up and walking. And in my mind, I'm thinking, gosh, give these guys a break. Like, let them rest a little. Yeah. You're having them walk right away. But there's actually science to it and a method to it. Um, ambulation means to walk about or move about. And this idea of ambulation is crucial, especially for seniors after an operation, uh, to prevent post-operative complications to promote blood flow of oxygen throughout the body. It stimulates circulation, which can help stop uh, stroke-causing blood clots, and also quicker wound healing. And so... Turns you into Wolverine. <laughs> turns you into Wolverine. But the idea is the quicker that you can get up and start moving, the better for your whole body and for your recovery. So good. And so the point is, is that... We just need to keep walking. No matter what has happened, even if it hurts or if it doesn't make sense, we just have to keep walking. And we were meant to walk. When God blessed God. our relationship with Him, it involved a daily stroll. And mm. so to think about that, if you need to get your life with God back on track, if you would say today, like, I'm not, I'm not where I once was. There was a time in the 80s or 10 years ago or last week where I felt God's closeness. Get back on track with the walk. We have gotten away from walking. We've upgraded everything, right? So we, 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 you can live a life in this world today where you hardly ever walk at all. True. You can get out of your Polaris, onto your four-wheeler, onto your horse, onto your bicycle, off the airplane, onto the tram, onto the Uber. I mean, think about it. We mm. literally can live a life walking free. And the Bible was, 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 mm. was given to us in a culture and a time when you walked everywhere. 
Jesus is always walking. So we went to Capernaum. You're like, oh, great. You go to Israel, you're like, oh, that's 30 miles. So you think about Jesus, just wow. the time he had to walk with God, the time he had to reconnect with himself, the time he had to train his disciples. Mm. So we have to reverse engineer that. We've got, we've got to get from great back to good. Yeah. Where is there walking in your life? The secret to a good life, in part, is walking with God, which I'm not a smart man, but I think it'll make that a lot easier if you actually do some walking with God. Mm. And I found, especially in, in grief, when we faced the loss of our daughter, Linya, going to heaven at the age of five, one of the ways I worked through that grief, people ask, how did you do it? I walked with God. Mm. I would feel overwhelming, shaking, panic attacks, and I would just get out there. Even in snow, it just, just get out there. During the pandemic, when I felt like I was going to scream, I would put Lennox in the stroller, and it would be like 20 degrees out with blowing wind. Man, I would like head to toe look like the Michelin man. But I was like, I need to walk. I'm losing my flipping mind. And so I think one of the things, if you're, you're needing something new and you walk with God, maybe what you need isn't new, it's actually old, mm. is get back to that goodness so and good. do some walking. Do you receive it in yeah. Jesus' name? Come on. It's so good. I've heard it said that walking is simple. Everyone can do it. Walking is good for you. Just like last week, we learned that community service is good for your health. I have some things here to tell us that walking is good for your health. Um, it will improve your mood. It will help you burn calories and lose weight. It will improve digestion. It will help other goals seem more reachable. It can help you feel more creative. If you're what feeling does it do for your sex life, asking for a friend? It's great. Um, if you feel stuck in creativity, it will help you be more, feel more creative. It can boost your immunity. It can help you live longer. It will help you sleep better at night. That's great. So walking is good for your soul. Walking with Jesus is essential. I love how the Psalms and the Proverbs, all over the Psalms and the Proverbs, we see all of, like what it, it means for us to walk. There's, he talks about paths of righteousness, the that God will direct our path. Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And what this all is kind of telling us is that walking is a weapon. Mm. What we can do is that as we walk, that there's something that happens as we walk with God, that walking can be more than what we think it is. That's great. And if he's our shepherd, so much of what a shepherd does for a sheep is walking. Mm. Hey, we've, we've eaten up all the good grass here. Time to move on to another pasture. Wow. If you're a sheep, you're like, I like it here. It makes sense here. I don't want to go over there. It's scary over there. But a shepherd's constantly moving, 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 moving. Let's get over here. Let's get over there. Let's do this. And, and that walking can become a weapon because Ephesians says that part of the armor we've been given is, is shoes that are linked to the good news, gospel shoes. Mm. And the shoes in Ephesians verse 15 of the sixth chapter, he puts it this way. He says that we are to having walk, having strapped on our feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. Mm. A part of walking with God is that constant reminder that gives your feet foundation, because life will make you slip. Yeah. Hard times will make you slip. You start doubting stuff. You start wondering. You start second guessing yourself. But when you remind yourself of the facts of the gospel, yes. and that is God's love for you, the ridiculousness of that love exemplified Gosh. at the cross, that it is a scandalous kind of love. It just doesn't mm. make any sense kind of a love. You don't have to do anything to earn it kind of a love. You can't do anything to lose it kind of a love. Come All on. of a sudden, you find yourself with some cleats on. Mm. You find yourself with some spikes. You find yourself with some so traction. Good. You find yourself trading out the flip-flop for a vibram sold shoe that gives you stability when you're feeling like life is full of scrambles and there's some shale sliding and you just feel like, I don't know what's going on. Now, all of a sudden, you got the weapon of walking on your feet and you're walking with God. Mm, amazing. Number two, walk humbly with your God. Humble in Hebrew is sana. I like it already. <laughs> sauna. Sauna. To, and it means I to really be. I really like saunas. Yes, he's obsessed. Um, to be modest or humble. Which, you know, you know, usually you're not super modest in a sauna. Oh. I'm just saying. Especially in Germany. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've heard. That is true. Humility. Humble. Humbleness. Um, we know that humble people understand their strengths. But they also accept their weaknesses. Um, and humility comes with gratitude. When you put yourself in a place where you're 
thankful, when you're saying, God, thank you that I get to call you father. Thank you that I get to live this life. Thank you for the marriage that I have. Thank you for the kids that I have. When you are full of gratitude, there's a humility that comes from that. Um, but we also know that pride holds us back. Yeah, right. Pride is what God has promised will be for all of us a downfall. Mm. Name one good thing that's come to someone who's been lifted up in pride. Yeah. Pride is the original sin. It is the, the, the sin that split heaven and started hell. It is the sin that created the devil out of an angel. Gosh. And it is the, the, the downfall of every leader, of every, of every great man or woman who's ever done great things for God. It is, it is leprosy to your soul. Mm. And that's why the Bible warns us about pride again and again and again. This morning, as we were getting ready, we had on the, in the background uh, our friend Shane Kimbrough spacewalking. He's spacewalking right now at this moment. Here's a photo I snapped uh, of, of, of him on the screen. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so uh, that's amazing. him on the outside of the International Space Station. Some of you heard from Shane during our Wild Blue Yonder series where we got to interview him a little bit. Uh, and, and so he just launched to space. We got to go and watch him from Pad 39A in Cape Canaveral launch to, uh, to, to the space station. And he's, uh, I got to live link right now. He still looks like he's about to go through the airlock. That's just unreal. You, you see him. This is right now. I mean, Gosh. he is moving at 17,500 miles an hour, 250 miles above us <laughs> in a tiny apartment complex the size of a football field with some Russian people in the Russian sector, a French guy, <laughs> and some Japanese. I mean, it's just unbelievable and just living in space for six months. Wow. But what we kept hearing, because we were preparing our message and I was hyper distracted by what was happening. Uh, they're installing a new solar array. They tried on Wednesday. didn't work out quite right. And so he's out there. You, you watch, he's carrying like a 500-pound thing with his fingertips because microgravity and bolting it on. And they have mission control down on Earth directing his steps. And they can see his camera view is inside his helmet. They see other camera angles. And Jenny, who is the Capcom, kept talking to, to them. And she kept saying, uh, when you have a moment, I have a caution. When you have a moment, I got a word of caution. And then Shane or Thomas would, would go. Tomas. Tomas, sorry. <laughs> it's French. That's how you say it in French. Is that how they say it in the Cambridge Dictionary? <laughs> All right. So, sorry, they normally get Webster's when I'm preaching. My bad. Uh, well, actually, the Apple Dictionary, that's on my laptop. But, um, yes. But the, the interesting thing about it is he would, they would say, OK, I'm ready, Jenny. I'm ready. And then they would give him the caution. And it would usually be like, hey, don't step on that thing to your left. Hey, tighten that nut to your right. Hey, watch out. This thing is coming really close to your helmet. It needs to not, because if they puncture their suits, in, they're almost in, instantly dead. I mean, it's just unbelievable to think Gosh. about it, because it's negative 250 in the shade, positive 250 in the sun, so that you would either freeze to death or, or burn to death it, without the, in the vacuum of space. And, and, and then she came on at one point, and Jenny goes, uh, Shane, when you have a minute, I have seven words of caution for you. <laughs> and then she rattled off this list of things. Don't put any more than this pressure on this. Don't that over here. You guys can't be touching the same thing at the same time. This wire's going by. You can't, you can't, you got to duck when it comes. And, and seven words of caution. And I was just thinking, man, there's a lot that can kill you in space. And then you read the Bible. And as we walk with Jesus, there, there are cautions. God says, hey, word of caution, word Ooh. of caution. Maybe yeah. some, some of us today, God's going, hey, word of caution. What's that yeah. word of caution? It's James 4. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Hmm. Think about what a word of caution. That's the Capcom speaking. Do you hear him? Hey, word of caution for you today. Hmm. You want God's blessing on your life? Humility. You want God opposing you? You're no match for him. I'm no match for him. We do not want, but how do we get God's opposition in our lives? Pride. Yeah. How do we invite God's blessing and strength? We walk, not just in any way, because you can strut. We walk humbly. Mm. But it's a misunderstood thing, humility. It's, it's kind of this picture, this warped picture. What does a humble person look like? Oh, shucks. Oh, you know. Like you give someone a compliment, and you see this like picture of humility they think it is. So you go, hey, great job. And they go, it wasn't me. It was the Lord, brother. You're like, actually, no, he would have done a really, really better job than you did. <laughs> there was a lot of you in that. I just said, great job, right? So you can say, thank just you. Say, when someone gives you a compliment, just say, thanks. You're making it weird for us all when you get all like Jesus juke spiritual on the situation. <laughs> C.S. Lewis said, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. So good. He went on to say that, that a humble person could have designed the greatest building in the world, the greatest skyscraper in the world, but they would take as much joy in that greatest building 
had someone else designed it. Mm. So you can hold your head, head high and be humble at the same time. But as we walk, let's walk humbly. So how do we foster humility in mm. our lives? That's so good. Well, holding our head high, I love that, because humility comes from a perspective of how big God is. So when we hold our head high, it's not because we're so amazing, but we're looking up to the God who is amazing. Beautiful. Isaiah 57, 15 says, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So the high and lofty one, he dwells with us in our humility. There's a closeness with God when we're humble. Um, Tony Evans says, to submit to God is to recognize your weakness to stop fighting and to surrender to him as your ultimate and final authority. And I love so much, Romans 12, one says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Wow. In view of the mercies of God. And this is the key to humility. If we keep the mercies of God in view, we're going to keep ourselves in the right position before him. And as we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, I mean, that's like ultimate humility. You're lying on a, I, I just picture Isaac when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac's there like strapped down and he can't do anything. But he could have, because he was so much stronger. He was a young than man Abraham. in the prime of his life, and his dad was over a hundred. I don't think he <laughs> could have forced Isaac onto the altar if Isaac didn't go along with the he plan. He willingly went. went along, but he was—he couldn't do anything. He was surrendered to God. So nothing will impact your humility like a like a bigger view of God. Mm. So whatever you can do that will foster a bigger God in your mind, right? There's a great old book called Your God is Too Small. Hmm. So to think about uh, anything, and, and for me, and that's different for all of us, for me, when I, when I look to the heavens, why does the Bible cons constantly say, consider the heavens, consider the heavens? Hmm. What is it saying? Go stargazing. Yeah. Maybe one of the best things you could ever do for your walk with God would be to buy a telescope. And when you're looking through it, you're going to remember, dang, I'm pretty small in the world. Go stand at the rim of the Grand Canyon. You know what hmm. you're going to feel like? You're not going to feel like going, I'm the man. Right? Like, no, one, no one does that. You look out at the Grand Canyon, you're like, holy crap. Like, <laughs> oh, I'm so small. Yeah. I'm so little. Who am I? And then you're going to remember the mercies of God. I'm so small, but the tension is I'm so loved. I'm loved Ooh. so much. Now all of a sudden, I'm so small, such a massive God who spoke the Grand Canyon, who breathes out Milky Way galaxies, but he's loved me? Now, all of a sudden, you got some humility clicking along in your soul. Yes, keeping the mercies of God in view and walking with God humbly. Um, number three, walk humbly with wow. your God. With. I didn't see it coming. I knew that was our point, but it <laughs> snuck up on me. With is accompanied by or accompanying side by side through stuff together. And here's the great news. We're not alone That's in this great. walking humbly. We're not just walking humbly on our own. We are with yeah. somebody. Studies show the impact of accountability on goal resolution. If you have a you know, plan to get in shape because you, you, you know, sick, you're sick of your dad bod, right? You're like, now I'm going to work out. If you enlist the help of someone else and that you know they're going to show up at your, in front of your house at 7 AM because you said you wanted to walk together with someone and we're going to go hit this trail and walk, mm -hmm. just the knowledge of someone else being involved makes it far less likely, though not impossible. I said that with my teenage daughter in the room because uh, <laughs> at nighttime, she's so optimistic. Dad, let's work out tomorrow. I'm like, I'm always wanted to clarify. Do you know this will mean me shaking you for seven minutes when it's, when it's 6 a.m., right? You see what I'm saying? But, but when you know someone else is involved, it's a lot easier to make good on it. And what's so beautiful about your walk with God is you're not alone. Yeah. God's going to meet you to walk with you. The Bible says, those who seek me will be found by me. Mm. If you show up to walk with God, he will never stand you up. He will meet with you and walk with you. You're not alone in this walk with God. That's right. God is involved with you in it. Yes, we walk with him, but we also walk with him as if we couldn't walk without him. There's a dependence 
on him. Jesus said in John 15, live in me, make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. We walk with our Savior. Number and four. I, and oh. I would say, well, before you move on, that's yes. so good. I would oh. say a reminder, and this is, I've only learned this walking with you for all the years of our marriage, which is now 17 years, mm. and that is walk with at the pace of the person you're walking with. Mm. Jenny and I have different <laughs> natural walking paces. Any husbands can relate. Your wife just maybe walks a little bit at a different speed than you do. <laughs> and so what I've learned is to not walk ahead of Jenny. And, and that's to slow down my pace to match her pace. Yes. And you're going to find, surprisingly, when you walk with God, he tends to walk at a slower pace than is probably your nature. Mm. And so part of the beauty of walking with God is the inefficiency of it and the way that you naturally are going to tend to need to slow your pace down. Jesus, even when he was going somewhere to meet an urgent need, if someone had wanted his attention, he'd stop and talk to him, yeah. fully present in the moment. And so maybe the, the beauty of you slowing down your natural type A, got to get here thing, dad, uh, is, is going to be that you're going to more notice how, how the people in your life are doing and who God has positioned in front of you for you to take a moment with and to be present and to be engaged and to be aware of what's happening. Yeah, and there's nothing quite like walking with a kid. Would we walk with Lennox? Horribly inefficient. I mean, it's the slowest thing ever. We usually never get to where we want because he's just looking at everything. And Squirrel. oh my gosh, there's a, there's goose poop. And you know, he's just, he loves everything. So that is one thing that's super special. If you feel like you need to slow down and you have a little one in your life, go for a, a walk with them because it'll, it'll slow it'll you down. It'll wake good. up your wonder too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Number four, walk humbly with your God with your God. Your is a possessive pronoun. It's personal. And it makes this relationship with God, this friendship with God, personal. It's your walk with God. It's your relationship with God. Luke 10, 27 says, love the Lord your God with all your, your heart, heart, with all your, your soul, with all your, your strength, and with all your, your mind and your neighbor as yourself. I mean, it's really belaboring how much God wants us to be, have an owner's mentality yeah. in our relationship with God. Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, for the simple reason, when was the last time you washed a rental car, right? <laughs> Got to get this back to Alamo, but man, I need to run it through the, the car wash, right? <laughs> when I look at my car returning it, sometimes with, filled with shame, I'm tempted to want to, right? <laughs> I can't believe we're bringing this back as it is, right? But, but the mentality of an owner is different. And so here's the question we wanted to ask you. Are you renting your relationship with God, or do you own it? Are you renting it? Meaning, are you standing on the faith of your parents? Mm -hmm. Teenagers, I'm asking you this. What are you going to do when you're 20? Yeah. Are you going to be in church? Is this something mom and dad care about, is it, or is this your own? Mm -hmm. And it, the, the, it's, 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 the time is now to ask those necessary questions, to figure it out, to have that crisis of faith, to, to look into these things, and to decide, is this yours, or is it not? Yeah. Because only a walk with God that belongs to you can save your soul. Only a walk with God that means something to you. Yes will bring you to that good life that you care for, that you want, that you desire to have. Hmm. And nothing is going to impact your figure more than your relationship with your father. Wow. And just like you can call him yours, he's proud to call you his. And Isaiah 43, 1 says, but now this is what the Lord your creator says, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you from captivity. I've called you by name. You are mine. And there's that sweetness. There's that just us and him. No one can walk with God for you. It's your walk with him, and he's proud to call you his. It's always the worst feeling in the world when, like, you're so excited about a friendship, and you're like, oh, I'm this person's friend, I'm this person, this, they're my friend. And then you get into a different setting, or maybe they you know, have other friends around them, and they totally cold shoulder you and pretend like they don't, know, they don't even know you. And you've been so proud that they're your friend, but then you see in, the, in, the, in, the, in a different setting, they're kind of like, oh, 
and they act, is that cold around you or, yeah. or different around you? And, and I think sometimes we can kind of feel like, oh, I love God, I love God, but does God really love me? Mm. And what I wanted to say is, and this is going to get a cringe out of any teenage child of mine who's listening, <laughs> that you're not a simp to God. You're not just doing these things for him, but he doesn't actually care about you and, and love you and has no intention of actually making good. The Bible says that he has written your name on the palm of his hand. Yeah. He is proud to be your God. Yes. He doesn't just want your worship, but then he's going to pretend he doesn't know you when you call out to him in public. He is proud to be your God. He loves you. He sees you as his child. He can't have possibly picked a term of endearment more close, more visceral than to say, call me dad. You call me father. I will stop everything. I'm running the world with my feet up, but I will stop anything and everything for you to run into my arms so I can embrace you and care about you and delight in the fact that you belong to me. Yes, yes, so good. And number five, walk humbly with your God, our Lord, our creator who made the heavens and the earth, our master, our friend. In the message translation, Micah 6, 8 says, but he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. So good. This is who this is all about. Walk humbly with your God. He is everything. So as we seek to live humbly and live this life, our number one job is to keep our eyes on Jesus, to keep our eyes on the Father. The Father of light sent his son as the light of the world. So good. He sent the figure of the Father, God in human form, in flesh. Jesus lived perfectly. Jesus did justly. De Jesus loved mercy. And Jesus walked humbly with his God, his Father. And like we learned, we've been learning in this series, the pressure isn't on us to get this perfectly. Men, fathers, the pressure isn't on you to be a perfect father. Jesus did this. He did it perfectly. The Father figure, the, with capital letters, the Father figure paved the way. And all we need to do is walk with him in the path that he's already paved for us and to walk humbly with him. That's beautiful. Jesus told Philip, who wanted to see God, he's like, I want to show us the Father. We'd be happy. Show us the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we go, what does it look like to be, to be a father figure? It's look to Jesus. Walk with Jesus. He gives us a picture of what we're trying to do here. And so we don't walk in shame. We don't walk in the regrets of, I wish I was a better father. I wish I could do certain parts of my fathering differently. Look, I got regrets. You got regrets. You don't have to live long before you realize you're not Jesus. But we get to walk with Jesus. We get to, we get to see what that picture looks like. We get to watch how he responds to our shortcomings. Yeah. We get to own them. Tell our kids, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm learning. I'm growing. We're growing together. I always tell new fathers, your kid comes out of the womb not knowing how to do literally anything. <laughs> So the pressure's off. Mm -hmm. They're not, they don't know how to be a human. You don't know how to be a dad. You're going to get to work this out together. And just like they're going to make many mistakes, so are you. So what do we do? We respond to our mistakes humbly, mm -hmm. because that's how Jesus lives. That's how Jesus rolls. He walked humbly. And the shocking thing, and where we really want to land this plane, is that when you walk humbly, you will find humility unlocks humility. Mm -hmm. And the humility you hope to see in your children one day, as you exemplify that, you're giving what you want and giving them the capacity to learn to foster that themselves. Because just like you look to Jesus as the father figure, hopefully your kids can look to you and see an example of what Jesus does as well. Mm -hmm. I had a powerful, powerful uh, reminder of this the other week. I was on an airplane, and one of my favorite moments is, thank God, our, our ministry has impacted a lot of people who fly airplanes and who are our flight attendants in, in the airline industry. And there's hardly a month that goes, by, that goes by where I'm not on a plane being handed a note. And that's, I guess that's what they do. They don't break protocol by coming to talk to you. But what usually happens is 
three quarters of the way or very close to the, the seatbelt light coming on for the plane to end, a flight attendant will kind of walk by that I've seen the whole plane ride that smiled at me every time they came by. And they'll just kind of furtively hand me a little folded up note like we're in third grade. And they'll, they'll just hand it to me and just kind of keep on going down the aisle. And I'll like wipe the drool off my face and, you know, the peanut shells off my chest and look at this note. And it's usually some version of, I watch you on YouTube every week. Your book got me through a difficult time when this happened or this, this thing. And, and I just want to let you know there's someone up here in the skies praying for you. And I was so blessed to see you walk on the door of this airplane. And I, I tell that to you, A, to let you know just, just what we're a part of is just God is using it all around the world, touching people all around the world. But also, because the other day, a cheeky British flight attendant said, screw you to protocol, and basically pounced on me when she recognized me. <laughs> like, I had walked on, I had a hat on, and then, you know, I kind of like, as we were settling in, she's like, ah! She's like, just, just like bombarded me. And she's like, I'm, I'm just reading Fight to Flourish right now. And it's red eyes of a lion. And, and, and you know, British accent. I was trying to understand what she, every fifth word she was saying. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you. Amazing. And, and, and you know, whatever. Then we got settled in. And then halfway through the flight, I was like, I'm going to go check on her and talk to her. It was awkward and embarrassing. And, you know, as it originally happens, now I'm going to talk to her now that everyone's not in the plane's not staring at us. And so I walked up, and she was kind of hiding behind the curtain, you know, where the flight attendants like eat their salad out of their Tupperware and read their novel, like where they're a human being for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's when I love chatting with them and asking them where they're based out of and how long they've been doing this and just any crazy stories they have. And so I had her and, and another flight attendant who was also super chill, but she watched us online too, and we were chatting. And, and I said, man, it must be really hard right now. I imagine the pressure you're under because of the rules being what they are. September 13th is when they say on the planes, they're going to let you know, not wearing masks anymore. I said, but right now, you're every day having to really kind of keep telling people who don't want to wear masks that they kind of have to. And then I was like, I imagine that's hard because it's not your rule. Like, you didn't come up with it. You just have a job, like we all do. And it's probably super hard. And she goes, she goes, you have, both of them were like, you have no idea. She goes, every day, every day, we're like the Antichrist. Every day, we're, we're like, we're just trying to, we'll get fired if we do not. Well, you know, and she goes, but you know what? I've really understood, and, and, and I wasn't expecting her to say this. She goes, I've really had a lot of lessons in how powerful humility can be. Oh. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, I find, here's my little trick. When I have a, a bowed up, keyed up client or customer on the plane who does not want to wear their mask over their nose and mouth, she goes, I just try and get lower than them. She goes, I found it's unbelievable what it changes in the tone and the atmosphere if I get lower than them. Because you know she comes walking by, and she's above in every way, because she's in charge. She's there, of course, for your comfort, but also primarily for your safety. safety. And, and so she's above. She's got this role. She's in charge. And I need you to do this. And I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And you know, she's still this guy just kind of, you know, I'm not wearing it. And she said at that moment, she just got on her knees. And she said, I got lower than him and said, please, sir. And she said something in his tone changed when she, when he, when she was lower than him. Mm. He, he realized how ridiculous he was being. He's like, I'm so sorry. And he grabs this thing and he puts it on. Wow. So she went away. And the next time she passed by, he grabbed her elbow and said, I, I just want to apologize. And I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm not proud of my behavior there. I got, but she, when you went low, I just realized, I saw myself. Wow. And she goes, hey, I just want to let you know. Thank, you're welcome. I, I received your apology. She goes, but just so you know, here's what, just so you have a picture of the things, the next thing I was going to do if I didn't, if this humility didn't work, is go talk to the captain. And he radios down. And when we land, there's police at the gate. Oh, my gosh. And you're escorted off and up to a $9,000 fine, potential of jail time, and you're banned from the airline for the rest of your life. And I just thought, wow. Wow, how, how razor thin the difference between having just a normal Tuesday and the worst day of your life is. <laughs> but her humility, which she didn't have to do that. And by the way, customer service people, anybody who does with people, let's all just learn. That's like the thing. You see what I'm saying? It makes it easy for the other person to do mm. the right thing. But I just think about us, father, <laughs> mother, how easy it is. Look, I've been there. I'm in charge. Do what I said because I said so. What do we really want in our kids? We kind of want humility. Get lower. 
It doesn't mean there's not times where the hammer's got to drop, right? It doesn't mean there's not consequences. It doesn't mean at times there's not difficult conversations. But what I'm saying is tone and spirit are everything. Yeah. Jesus is proof. He could have easily, when he came to this earth, walked around on an ego trip, created the world, because I said so. But what did he do? He stooped. Yeah. He washed. Yeah. He cared. He listened. Being God of God, he humbled himself, Philippians says, to the point of being a man, to coming as a servant, to dying, even the death of the cross. Therefore, since he humbled himself, God has highly exalted him hmm. and given him the name that's above every name. And through his humility, something is unlocked in our hearts. Yes. He doesn't bow up. He bows low. He stoops. And today, those who hear his voice, who listen to him, get the gift of walking in that example. And we will make it so much easier for our children to follow our lead as we exemplify what Jenny has so well preached and what we've been trying to communicate and trying to live ourselves. And that is the power of the father figure in Jesus' name. Yes. Let's pray together. Yes. Father, we look to you. Thank you for being our, our father, our perfect father. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for this life that you've called us to live. Thank you for giving us the secret to a good life. And in this moment, I just want to pray for anyone here who maybe is struggling in their relationship with their father. Maybe their father has passed away. Maybe their relationship with their father is estranged and they haven't talked to them in years. Or like mine, I love him so much, but he's, he's alive on the other side of the world and there's no real relationship. I just want to pray over you today. Lord, I pray for those who are hurting in their relationships with their fathers or fathers who are hurting in their relationships with their kids. Lord, I thank you that you are the God who redeems and who restores and who heals. And in that, sometimes we don't see the restoration that we think there should be or the redemption that there should be. And there's, there's waiting or there's waiting on the other person to show up and to, to be there. But Lord, I pray right now for just a... Uh, a realization that you are near and that you are with them and they're not alone I pray for their hearts as they seek to walk humbly with you Lord that you'd give them the strength that you'd strengthen their hearts that you'd strengthen their minds that you'd give them vision and purpose to regardless of the relationship they have with their dad or the relationship that the fathers have with their kids, Lord, that you would strengthen them. You'd help them to see their role as a father figure, their role as the person in people's lives to bring encouragement, to bring light, to bring life, to speak love, regardless of the hard situation that they're in. I pray that you would refresh them. I also just want to pray for all the fathers in the house. I pray for for you to strengthen their hearts, for you to strengthen their minds. I pray, God, that you would, even just from this message, that you would instill in them the vision for their lives, the purpose for their lives, the beautiful thing that it is to be a man of God. Yes, imperfect. Yes, not having it all together, but trusting you, looking to you, following you, and walking with you. And I pray that over every single male in this church. Yeah. And Lord, for anyone who doesn't know you, who doesn't have this relationship with you, I just want to pray for them right now that they would see that you love them, that you want a relationship with them, 
and that they would surrender to you now, that they would say, yes, God, I give you my life. And if that's you today, if you don't have a relationship with God, but you're at a place right now where you're saying, yes, I want that. Then I want to lead you into a prayer, accepting Jesus as the Lord of your life, saying yes to him as your father. In our church, we're all going to say this prayer with you. and We're going to lead with you. But you can pray this after me. You can say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I'm far from you. But thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. My father figure. Who drew me close to you. Who saved me. I believe in him. I turn to you in faith. I surrender to you. I give you my life. Have your way in me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.